Hi everybody, Mr. Record here, video number 11 for topic 9.4. We're going to talk about the domain of a vector valued function and finally, finally we get to talk about really the crux of 9.4 and it's about vector valued functions. All right, so excited, I'm kind of hungry for some french fries all of a sudden. So let's take a look at our example. So for 9.1, that would be the very beginning of Unit 9, we discussed and defined a plane curve. We used parametric equations, if you remember, and we called x f of t and y g of t, and we're able to do all sorts of things with them. And we knew that f and g had to be continuous functions of t on some interval i in order to be able to manipulate those. Well, we're now just simply going to define a function that's called a vector value function. So basically, you can see that the things that come out in front of the i and the j are nothing more than functions of t now. That's all there is to it, right? No more are they just single numerical values like 3i plus 4j, but they're expressions of t, which means we can do a lot of really cool stuff with them now. So vector value function, sometimes called a vector function, always takes the variable t and returns a vector. And the domain of a vector valued function is the set of all t for which both component functions are defined. And I think the key word here, my friends, is both. So let's take a look at a couple of examples here from number 11. It says to find the domain in of the following vector valued functions. So the very first thing that I would do to organize this is just to kind of take apart the y or the i component here and just focus on what he has to offer. We know that the only way that this square root of t plus 1 can be defined is if all of the stuff underneath the square root avoids being negative. So that means it can be positive or it can be zero, but it cannot be negative. So if we write that as t plus 1 greater than or equal to zero, we ultimately can solve this and say that t has to be greater than or equal to negative 1. Likewise, we're going to do the same thing with this natural log of 4 minus t expression. Now what I like about these problems is it really does harness some really good understanding about function behavior that could even help you perform well on older stuff in the course, way, way, way back in the AB portion of the course. Because the natural log, you know, cannot act upon a negative number, nor can it act upon zero. So you have to know that 4 minus t has to be strictly positive. It can't even be equal to zero. So that means when you solve by adding the t over, t would be less than 4. Now, in order to answer the overall question, what is the domain of this vector valued function, you have to take the intersection of these two sets. Now, one way to do that would be to maybe use some set notation and say, OK, the set where t is greater than or equal to negative 1 intersect symbol with the set t less than 4 will always produce something that's in between, right? If you're greater than negative 1 but smaller than positive 4, then our answer is everything that's in between. And there's actually two ways to write the answer. One of them is using this very nice, very formal set notation. I like that. Maybe you might see something like that on a multiple choice question that you'll have to uh, recognize. Or the other option is you could use your good old interval notation, but as those of us who read for the AP exam will always say, we often don't like to ask questions like this in an open-ended response because students can kind of use parentha brackets. They might draw something that you can't distinguish between a parenthesis and a bracket. So uh, I guess they're thinking, hey, you have to count it right. Right. We know we know your tricks, students. So you can think of it as either way. Let's take a look at part B. In part B, we have a slightly different pair of functions here, e to the negative t. Well, when we think about him, I want you to think about freedom. T can be anything it wants to be. It can be negative, it can be positive, it can be zero, it can be very ugly, irrational numbers, right? You could plug pi in for t if you wanted to. Uh, 
So what this basically says is that this is going to be true for all real numbers. Or you could even state the interval negative infinity to positive infinity. So there's not a lot of restrictions on e to the negative t. Now sine inverse, different story. And this is a little tricky for students. A lot of times students forget what the innate domain restrictions uh, are for the inverse sign. And maybe this might help you a little bit graphically uh, if you're having trouble with this. So if I were to take a look at the graph of sine, that blue curve is our good friend, the graph of sine. However, that graph in and of itself does not have an inverse because he fails what's called the horizontal line test. He fails being what we call one-to-one. -one. He's not strictly monotonic. But if we restrict his domain to lie along where the red graph is, then we have something that we can take the inverse of. We have a graph that's monotonic or one-to-one -one or strictly increasing in this case. And therefore, the domain of this particular graph will become the range of its inverse and vice versa. So you can probably see that the range negative one to one is indeed going to become our domain of our inverse. And it just so happens, I've gone ahead and sketched the graph of the inverse here. And it looks something like this with the scale modified the way that it should be. And you can see that the domain does exist between negative one and one. Little trig lesson there for you. So you have this particular idea here if I just use interval notation. And then if you take the intersection of these two ideas, it pretty much keeps you stuck with the negative one to one. So you could write the final answer in set notation real formally like this. Or you could just use the same inequal or interval notation that I used up here. And that would be your domains for the answers for the problems in example 11. Thanks for joining. We'll see you next time.